What's up and welcome back to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your weekly dose of what's going on in pop culture. My name is Pat Sheehan, joined by my trusty co- co-host, ooh, almost put your name in the intro, Dave Martin Swagger, a.k.a. the uh, the Gucci God, a.k.a. Uh, Adam Driver 2.0, a.k.a. Mm. Father Son House of Gucci. How you doing, man? Doing well, man. Doing well. Getting in before the movie release. That's how you do Halloween. Gotta, you know, gotta be up on these things. Can't be doing Squid Game now. Halloween needs to be last month to do Squid Game. <laughs> uh, and very timely because we flipped the calendar tonight. And now we're in November. And uh, the movie's going to keep on rolling in. We're talking about some big movies today. We're talking about some... Some albums. I'm just not going to put any qualifiers on those because I think uh, we'll, we'll. I'm I'm interested to hear what your your thoughts are on them, and then uh, also a, a good TV show wrapping up. But Dave, we are here on Nostalgia Pod, and if you're subscribed on YouTube.com/slash Nostalgia Pod, you would know this. Big fans of Kanye West. Big fans of the music of Kanye West. Let's qualify that. Ah. And uh, yeah, Kanye. Uh, if you go go check out our. Kanye rankings, which came out recently. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we really did a deep dive if you want to hear all of our thoughts on that. Um, Kanye started Good Music, a label which has brought us many, many hours of music that we enjoy, I'd say. Right? Mm-hmm. You agree with that? Absolutely. Big Sean announced that he is no longer with Good Music this past week. And it, you asked me, is Good Music the label dead? Yeah, and I, I, I thought maybe this is a good discussion for the pod. So I want to flip it back to you. What was your just initial reaction to seeing Big Sean left? You know, on one hand, can't be too surprised given everything else that's happened with good music, which we can get into. On the other hand, he was the longest running signee left after Kanye himself. Big Sean had been with good music since 2007, obviously. Uh, Big Sean getting his big break from Kanye is, you know, well told uh, story at this point. But to see Big Sean finally uh, move on, saying that he completed his deal and that uh, it's still a brotherhood, but he needed a, a bigger piece of the pie, uh, to paraphrase, still, uh, you know, still, I think, noteworthy to see that happen. He also uh, announced this alongside a brief EP with Hit Boy someone who had already uh, left good music some time ago. So I, I, I think it's just kind of the, the latest entry in this story that's been ongoing. But at this point now, without one of his longest running uh, signees in Big Sean, Kanye really doesn't have anybody with much of a track record left at the label, uh, apart from, of course, Pusha T. So it's it's been a downturn no question yeah uh you know you mentioned that there's been a lot that's gone on with the label you know it's it's funny because when you look at who's left here um it's it's really like a, a stars and scrubs type uh cast and that and that that's really not to say that we don't like some of these other uh mm-hmm. artists but you got kanye and pusha t obviously q-tip who uh has his own legendary career prior to good music uh and then it's i guess 070 shake francis mm-hmm. and the lights valet and check west that that's it that's, that's it. who's left in good music bro come on and kids see ghosts i guess but that's just a kanye and uh cutty right. vehicle i don't know if I really and there's that. some people that seem like they are still technically signed to the very good beats production arm uh of good music such as mike dean and Charlie Heath, that's of course where Hit Boy had uh, left from, Hudson Mohawk had left from, et cetera. So it seems like there's more people that might still be signed, but it's also hard to actually know. A lot of times this stuff doesn't get publicized until the artists themselves kind of tell everyone. Um, but yeah, I mean, this thing about, I think and the, the key thing with all of this is if you just look at some of the names that you did mention that are still there, 070 Shake and Vale come to mind. Jack West as well someone who recently left, designer. All those people joined the label once Pusha T had taken over as the newest and still current president of the label. 
And I think that was a, even though Kanye was never actually the president, that was supposed to be a, a passing of the torch in a sense that Kanye really didn't have the time to run the label and that Pusha T was left more in charge. I believe Stephen Victor is also involved as well in a different position. If someone other than Kanye was running the show from a leadership position, they could actually foster new talent and as well as find new talent, right? And a lot of those are good signings, right? Oh, uh, yeah. D- designer made plenty of sense after what Kanye did with Panda to help blow it up and, you know, with Father Stretch My Hands and all that, right? But what's been kind of clear is that the label isn't actually good at like furthering a career unless you're actually doing stuff with Kanye. It's really not that different from a lot of the stuff we've said about Drake and OVO, you know, the weekend and XO. It, it just seems to be kind of the, the way it goes when you have this one singular force. And I think the, the key difference with Kanye compared to these other labels is that Kanye still wants to be involved with music. Right. And, and the last, the last probably last gasp of good music as a label was the Wyoming albums in 2018, right? Where Kanye was the EP for all of them. But let's not forget Nas was involved in this, not a signee of the label, you know, big Sean mm-hmm. was not there. Um, so I feel like that was kind of the last gasp. And then, you know, seeing what happened with designer who left and he wasn't very happy with how that was, uh, how it was handled. He felt like he was kind of there to write for Kanye. He wrote a lot for Yandi, which didn't come out, but his own career was never really benefited by good and death jam. And, uh, Sheck West had a famous quote from like years ago at this point. I wish Kanye was more involved in my career. And you know what? I think I do too, because Sheck West hasn't made a whole lot of noise since uh, Mo Bamba in that debut album. So it, I think it's just kind of, you know, it, it's run its course. You know, Cruel Summer is coming up on nine years old now, already nine years old. So uh, I think creatively, Kanye just doesn't have enough to give to other people. You know, he can barely give it up to himself these days, as we've seen with his album rollouts and uh, wait, inability to self-edit usually. So I think the label, the label, the label must must be dead, you know, like it, it, at least as an idea to invest in anyway, it's certainly dead. You know, it's interesting. So just uh, looking through Daytona and King Push, you know, Push T's latest albums, you don't see any of these good artists, good music artists on it at no. all. Um, you see Rick Ross <laughs> pop up, you see Kalani, but you know, none of this, none of this young talent is on there. So you mentioned how uh, these younger artists are looking and asking, where's Kanye, you know, like <laughs> I signed to this label. I was hoping to be getting some of that creative juice. Um, Push is not given it either. And so uh, obviously I think there's plenty of uh, finger pointing that could uh, go around here. You mentioned uh, 070 shake ballet, um, I think Shaq West and Francis in the Lights. I really like all those artists. I think they all are talented in their own different way. Um, you know, it's it's funny because Francis in the Lights just like sticks out like such a sore thumb in that group to me. Um, I, I think just because he doesn't do any rapping. I guess 070 Shake isn't as much of a rapper and more of a singer as well. Right. But um, just like a very like interesting part of it. You know, I also wonder for these artists and you know, someone like um, Big Sean, Tiana Taylor, these more established artists who are a little further along in their career. I wonder if they're just kind of like fed up with a little bit of like the Kanye exploits. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the songs he's put out um, in recent years have been, uh, I think, questionable, say the least, something like I love it with Little Pump. Um, Just like, if you're one of these like younger artists and you see Kanye working with a little pump over you, not even on the label, it's gotta be a little frustrating, right? It's gonna be yeah. a little bit like who's, who's really helping me out here. So I, I, I think there's plenty of finger pointing to go around, but you know, I think overall, if good music is dead, which I mean, I think like we were pointing out, there's still some talented artists. What do you, what do you see good legacies music as at this point? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it, it's inescapable from Kanye. I couldn't help but think of all the other uh, labels that kind of also serve as like creative collectives that also happened in the last 10 years. You know, I mentioned OVO, which everyone knows how that's done nothing for anyone except for Drake. And EXO has barely made any noise apart from the weekend, and like Nav, you know, and like Nav's 
found a career for himself, but like Exo's not much of a, a force either, right? Maybach Music Group at one point was pretty much going head to head with good music at the beginning of the decade. MMG has largely fizzled out as well, even though Ross and Meek are still active artists. It's kind of the same story, honestly. Even Pro Era, which I've invested in, many people have invested in. We talked about this a few weeks ago with Kirk Knight's recent album that notice, noticeably was not on Pro Era. Is Pro Era kind of fizzled out as well as far as like more independent, less mainstream creative labels go, right? Other than like TDE, uh, TDE has the best track record in terms of multiple artists uh, putting out good work, but that even might be running its own course. Kendrick is leaving, right? And he's mm-hmm. their biggest star. So I'd say Good Music probably has the second had the second best run as an overall label after TDE, um, but it does have the the best and one of the few true label albums in Cruel Summer, which yeah. is undeniably important and had a lot of great songs. So. That's that's what I latch on to is mm-hmm. that. And I think uh, the Cruel Summer time was really great. And I really have a lot of like, uh, nostalgia for that, nostalgia for that. Uh, um, and I remember when that random good music song Champions came out. Talk of the next one, cr- next label album, Cruel Winter. I was fucking hyped for that. Obviously, no chance that that was ever going to happen. It doesn't seem like they ever tried to make it happen either. So. Uh, it, it is what it is, but you know, I, you can still look back on like what actually did come out, and that there was some good stuff. But most of that is, you know, more than five years ago at this point. It's been a while, almost a decade ago for some of it. Yeah, um, kind of crazy to think about. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking the only group that feels, I think, a little bit exciting in the good music way right now, and I, uh, I'm not as well versed in the various labels. I think is. Um, Greenville, actually, kind of right now because yes. you know they've uh, JID. I think is a mm-hmm. rising star there. Ari Lennox, I like them. I think that just Earth that, Gang, yeah, Earth Gang. I think that's just a collective that um, makes a lot of sense and has put out some some good collective records. Recently. Yeah, that's so. an oversight on my part for sure. The Dreamville album did get nominated for Rap Album of the Year two Grammys ago, and. That used to be a talking point with like Cole stands where it's like, no, Dreamville is the best. Dreamville is the best. And it wasn't the case before, but honestly, it's probably the case now. And maybe that'll continue to be the case. And it's not that Cole is necessarily any more of a foster of talent than Kanye has been. But the story about how they made that Dreamville album where they actually really brought everyone together and just did tons of recording sessions kind of harkens back to the way Connie used to actually do things, you know? So Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. I think that that's probably the one because TDE also hasn't made a lot of noise with newer signings post Isaiah Rashad and SZA, you know, they got signed a while ago at this point. So yeah, yeah, I think, I think Dreamville is the one, you know, one other thing I was thinking about with Kanye, obviously good music's been around since 2004. He signed a lot of people. There's that first wave of people he signed and then big Sean released the notable person that he signed after that but Kanye's had falling out with people that he's worked with you know coming up on 20 years of that now and a lot of times he's mended the bridge Kid Cudi has been off good music for what six years or whatever it is it's been a long time 2013 right uh Tony Williams has been off for ages both those guys are on Donda they are cool with Kanye once again uh yep. Sci High has had his ups and downs with Kanye, seems to be back on good terms, you know. Uh well, even I think Big that's Sean another that's another part of it, right? Where Big Sean, he doesn't seem to have much ill will uh towards no. the team, besides maybe some business things, but it's almost like the access to Kanye is not as valuable as it once was when you're figuring how much more you're sacrificing from the business end in terms of like royalty cuts and stuff and masters. So it's not that there's anything against Kanye, but it's like it's almost like a cost benefit analysis. And that t- that that chance was more appealing back when Kanye was at a different point creatively. Right. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. Um, you know, you mentioned the w- ill will from Big Sean. Big Sean tweeted that, you know, good music will always be a brotherhood. But this was mostly just a he outgrew the contract, wanted to start his own label, right. um, make more money. 
And that's kind of what happens with these rappers. Probably was overdue for Big Sean, to be completely honest. Yeah. But, you know, we if you want to hear our thoughts on Big Sean records, it might explain why he may be staying on the label, on the label longer. Um, but yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure we'll see Big Sean pop back up in some Kanye projects whenever those pop up themselves. So, right. um, you know, good music, long live good music. But Dave, why don't we shift from one Chicago rapper to another mick jenkins dropping elephant in the room i think this is technically his third like album Correct. but like he's got plenty of projects mixtapes whatnot been really like putting music out um let's getting noticed since like early 2010s i believe like 2012 ish um mm-hmm. you know just in like thinking about <laughs> mick jenkins I, I wasn't like super jazzed to listen to this album um he's not a rapper i feel like super tuned into um i I just think he never really has like caught my attention all that much in listening to this um i kind of had that validated because i felt like um i felt like he uh didn't do enough on this to really like vary the songs up and i listened to this just kind of as i was like doing stuff and i didn't perk up nearly as much as i was hoping to and not really a good uh not really good sign how did you feel about elephant in the room though did it catch you more yeah i thought it was all right um mix mick jenkins has been a artist that i think the promise that was hyped up tremendously as part of that big chicago jazz rap wave when chance the rapper was blowing up that mick jenkins promise it was not one i had invested in as much as say other peers of chance like like vic and saba you know there's a no name there's a ton of ton of people in the in and around this scene from the last like six years and mick's been one of those people but i always thought that like his his, his storytelling talent is what sets him apart from the other people uh he's often lumped in with but as you say i think sound wise he does sound a little bit samey more often than not not that he doesn't have good moments but I'm still I'm still kind of waiting for like that really like standout project. I think there's some nice uh, moments of songwriting on uh, Elephant in the Room, but yeah, as as you kind of said, it doesn't drastically change my perception of Mick Jenkins. On the other hand, though, he just seems to kind of be grinding in and out. You know, he had EP come out being in 2020 as well. Um, seems to kind of just be doing his thing, and that's pretty cool. You know. Um, a lot of those other people he's been lumped in with are getting quieter than I'd like, like say like Tokyo, for example. But Mick, yeah, I think he's uh he's just kind of settled in to to who he is, and that's cool. But it's not like the most groundbreaking thing. Yeah, like you mentioned it, it really just fits for that uh, Chicago uh, jazz rap sound, and this is like some really like smooth, laid back jazz rap. Um, there's not really many moments that like switch things up from just that chill vibe which I, you know it's pleasurable music to listen to it's not like this is like poorly made or not well executed but it's just it just doesn't grab me really um you know a couple of songs so that i liked i'd say contacts stood out i thought that was a good track was um yeah enjoyed that one um i liked dui a lot um i think it might have been the like like high keys in the background ding, ding, ding. Mm-hmm. Um, caught me and then uh i liked reflection a lot too um i think it's just the way he, he like wrote the flow of that song which is really impressive but mm-hmm. what about you what songs stood out yeah so i liked how the uh I liked the first track the valley of the shadow of death i thought one of my favorite lines was on it. in general there's a lot of like name dropping and like highly referential bars on this which i feel like is is new for mick but i really liked his line on on valley uh i had to learn it the hard way dudes pennies decreasing or something like that obviously penny hardaway reference i thought that was cool uh i like that song i liked gucci tried to tell me as kind of more of a he's still rapping but it's clearly more of a love song more of a song about relationships and whatnot nice reference to uh boot up lmi i like that speaking of Mm. lmi please release your second album we really need that yeah (laughs) for real uh and then, all, I mean, obviously, I think he makes some noise with uh, the second track, Things You Could Die For If Doing While Black, makes a lot of reference to 
the things people were doing when they were killed by the police, such as selling loose cigarettes comes up. You know, I think that song, it's not like the most replayable song I've ever heard, but I thought he kind of went about the theme in a solid way. Yeah, no, I think all those songs are like good. I think things you could do for uh, things you could die for uh, things you could die for if doing while black. Sorry. Um, I think that that song is like a good concept. And I think I think lyrically he's solid throughout the album. I just think it's so like downbeat. It just kind of fades yeah. into the back for me. Um, so, you know, I think that's just kind of my overall take and uh, not not bad music. He's going to keep doing his thing, but hopefully he's got something in the future that pops a little bit more for me. But yeah, you know, he's not making it for me. No, right. <laughs> and I think uh, because he had such a lower register, like a really like yeah. bassy, rich, but deep voice, when it's also like lower tempo, traditional jazz rap production, it can be perhaps like sleepier than it should be because he has good technical ability. He can rap. And I think if we switched up these production choices a little bit, his uh, style of delivery would sound really good. And like you still get that in spots like contacts, as you said, that song's really hot. That song goes, but he doesn't often actually make like rapping ass songs like that all that much. So maybe he will in time. Yeah, well, we might throw one of his tracks onto our Nostalgia Best of 2021. So check that out. I want to move on to rock music, though, Dave. Uh, the War on Drugs. Love the name, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> we haven't uh, we haven't really reviewed the War on Drugs bef- before, I believe. And I think uh, when I think of them, I kind of just think of this like very vibey band. <laughs> um, you know, I I remember them really blowing up. I believe it was with their third album. Yes. Um, God, I'm, I'm misremembering. 2014, I think it was. Yeah, Lost in the Dream. Um, and that, that was like around when I was really going to music festivals a lot and saw them all over uh, festival lineups. And they were like the perfect mid-afternoon, like go chill, grab a drink, like catch your like second or third wind of the day type band because they're just going to jam and like you're going to like totally just fall into the vibes. And they make really, really solid albums that are critically acclaimed. But just not a band I found myself going to to like hmm. like a lot unless I was like working, <laughs> you know, just have something on the background and just kind of get in the zone or if I was studying that sort of thing. Um, how how much have you like engaged with their music prior to listening to this? Not too much. Uh, a deeper understanding that most recent album from twenty seventeen that did win the Grammy for best rock yeah. album for what that's worth and. I kind of view that album like I view this new one where it's like it's really solid and vibey and I I see why people like it and there's really nothing I have bad to say about it, you know, and I guess in the grand scheme of things that goes a long way with new rock music. So (laughs) it's I I think uh, the vocals, they, they could be punchier for my taste, but. Overall, I still think the music is 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 quite good. So it's it's not stuff I normally listen to, but I, I think that I think highly of the band. I, I I laughed when you said um, the vocals could be punchier because one of my like first notes was, man, these vocals are so much crisper than their past albums, um, <laughs> which is just kind of like you know for lost in a dream or a deeper understanding they've really gone with this like washed out like mm. uh rock jam sound which totally works i mean they they're like i said their albums are all really good um but th- i think that's the thing that stood out to me was they are definitely making some very clear production choices to pull through that like fog or that mist of their songs and to really stand out more with something crisp and that you hear that in the second song harmonious dream where I think it's some of their like, I mean, it's really good songwriting, but just the sound and the vocals compared to other ones are so much, they stand out so much more from the, uh, you know, the acoustics in the back of the, the guitars. And they also have a little like, um, I don't even know, like the, the synths that come up in you know, the second half of the song really like stand out uh, for their production. And I, yeah. I just was like, man, they're really trying something different on this album. Um, I I think this is a solid album. I think your take is right. Like 
the war on drugs never totally like blows me away as like man this rock album is great but i'm always like man that was really good like i, I enjoyed listening to that so yeah th- this new one really reminded me of bruce springsteen like i was like hmm. this th- th- that's just the vibes i was getting on this that being said like i don't live here anymore that's a really big rock song and like that that chorus i think is quite memorable but that also kind of reminds me of like a you know a bruce song um you mentioned the synths i think on victim that's where i really noticed the synths coming in for the production but in general i feel like the stuff stays pretty high tempo you mentioned harmonious Mm -hmm. dream i think that one you know really maintains that and it's funny because like the vocals don't always seem to match tempo for me but you have that tempo you have that really consistent drum work like it kind of all seems to gel together for this kind of jammy uh, stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, other than I think old skin, which I found pretty slow in the beginning of the song before the guitars come back. Other than that, I mm-hmm. thought all the other stuff was, you know, perfectly solid, like good, good rock, you know, music to jam out to. Um, I know a lot of people really ride for their lyrics. Um, is that something you've been attached to? Because for, for, from what I've gathered, the, uh, you know, this album run and this, this album growth album to album is impressing a lot of people. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, so the way I usually listen to music is I usually hear like the overall just like sound of it first. And then like right. on a second or third listen, I'll catch the lyrics a little bit more. So I probably need a couple more listens to like really get my take on the lyrics of this album, like super deep. Um, I think what I will say is that having listened to lost in a dream a couple of times, um, I thought that was pretty strong songwriting. And so if, if what the critical take has been is that they've grown across these, then I'm sure that this is probably pretty strong. But again, I'd have to uh, have to go back and listen before I could really say one way or the other. Um, you know, a, a couple of, of moments that really stood out to me, a couple of songs. Um, Change, which comes up right after Harmonia's Dream, reminded me of like a Brandon Flowers song a little bit, um, like his solo stuff, um, where it's like, even the vocals a little bit seem to be a little more like like Brandon's like down beat or down energy uh, solo stuff, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, it really felt like they were pulling from some contemporaries, like uh, Harmonia's Dream at times, like the synths remind me of Future Islands. They have a little bit of like a guitar twang at the end of Harmonia's Dream that reminds me of uh, maybe some like country type stuff, some country rock type stuff. I don't, so I don't know if they were trying to be a little bit more uh, eclectic in this album, but I think it all really works together uh, really well. I don't want to wait sit out too. Um, I really like the guitar distortion that comes in at like the three minute mark, just really like punches the song up. And uh, yeah, then the title track, I think is just absolutely fantastic with Lucius. So it, a really solid album, probably, is it maybe the best rock album we've heard this year? I'm trying to think. <sighs> You know, it just might be. I'm trying to even remember what's come out this year. I immediately started thinking of stuff from last year. Yeah, uh, we've had the Killers uh, drop an album that was Foo Fighters, uh, Royal Man, Blood, that, that Fighters. Greta Van Vliet. Oh, Greta Van Vliet. I mean, go go check out that uh, Black Midi, review. Squid, Black Country, New Road. Mm, I, I think this is probably the top of it for me. Kings of Leon. Hard before we forget. <laughs> Lucy Dacus. Uh, did Phoebe drop her album this year? Maybe it's no, that was last year. Was it last year? Man, it's all, uh, it's all blending together for me. I'm trying to see here. Saint Vincent, technically. Yeah, yeah. This Halsey, is kind of. For me. Uh, yeah, Halsey uh, Willow. I mean, Willow probably is the most popular yeah. rock rock song of the year. <laughs> uh, thanks to TikTok. Right. Um, Soccer Mommy hasn't dropped that album yet. I'm waiting nope. for Snail her. Mail's coming out this week. Yeah, Snail Mail. Oh, you know, Japanese Breakfast might fall into rock. So that might be it for me. I'm thinking about it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a solid I mean, year. But the, 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 yeah. the, that's pretty good as far as, you know, rock years. It doesn't take a lot these days to have a solid year. So I think, that, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, man, it's just it's just so funny to think like, we're just like, oh, there are some decent ones. Okay, maybe it's Olivia Rodrigo. Maybe that's the best rock album of the year, for being honest. Mm. Depends on how you want to Piss off some purists with that one. 
<laughs> um, anyways, uh, check out the uh, the newest album. Uh, I don't live here anymore from the War on Drugs. And Dave, you know what? We were talking about the best rock albums of the year. Did Ed Sheeran drop the best rock album? Oh my God, I just Come saw on. the picture you chose. I just started dying laughing. Oh man, equal. He's the, he's the Joker, baby. Equals. <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh ed sheeran man so the, what was the last time we talked about him a few years back um he did that yeah. album where he like rapped a lot on it. number six collaboration project yes. from 2019 <laughs> his effectively dj khaled movie soundtrack type album where he had a ton of guests just come on make songs with him that was that his was most recent work his last solo album is a few years older that was a divide from 2017 featuring of course shape of you the biggest song of his career yeah that song is a monster i'm just i'm looking through uh number six collaborations project i'm just trying to see if there's any songs here i remember uh i can't take me take one. me to london back to london with uh stormzy um maybe south of border cardi and camilla those are the songs i like the most but Overall, I didn't have positive things to say about that one. Yeah. Anyways, drops equal this past weekend. Uh, Long awaited album. I don't know if you can say that. I mean, where do you see Ed Sheeran at in like just the music scene right now? He was he was enormous for a few years with Divide. He still is enormous. Let's is he? He's totally still enormous. Shape of You is the most streamed song on Spotify period yeah yeah he's cur- but that, that's from 2017 bro well he's currently the number two artist on spotify right now yeah i guess he's still with, enormous uh, he's uh, right behind bieber with i believe 75 million uh that's insane almost 76 yep, million, million monthly listeners for ed sheeran right now which is basically just off of the two singles four equals bad habits and shivers as well as all the other stuff that's obviously from past work and again like he's one of the biggest artists of the 2010s, bar none, you know? Um, oh, absolutely. Second biggest artist in the UK for the decade after Adele. But overall, um, divide, multiply, multiple, uh, many of those songs, including Shape of You, are just some of the, the best-selling uh, songs worldwide of the last 10 years. He's a huge artist. And he also is more ubiquitous than I even realized. I was looking. He, he, he does a lot of songwriting for other people. Like he writes almost 10 songs a year, it seems like for other people, um, mm. including two BTS songs. He's collaborated with them with um, one from Map of the Soul Persona and then uh, Permission to Dance this year, which was like the butter B-side. So he he's very active on that in that regard. And I guess like the number six collaborations project thing was almost like a holdover project. It's like, ah, this isn't really yeah. my my solo stuff. I'll just kind of throw together some stuff with some other A-listers and it'll be successful because I'm Ed Sheeran. But like creatively, there wasn't much to that. You can check our review out on that. And now to have equals come out, it's like, do I know anyone who had like hype for an Ed Sheeran album? Of course not. But like, that's just the thing about Ed Sheeran. He has a way with pop radio melody that it's just he's part of the machine, but he's made himself part of the machine because he's just so successful at making really accessible pop music. And I, you know, it's really funny too because you remember when Bad Habits came out a few months ago, which peaked number two in the country. Bad Habits was critically panned. Everyone was like, this song sucks. It's so vanilla, so uninspired, so bland, so algorithm, right? Which, by the way, is all true. And yet the song is still very catchy and was a huge hit, you know? So whose opinion really matters at the end of the day? <laughs> Uh, those 75 million listeners on Spotify yeah. that we are now one of. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that I asked the question and, and I think you really hit now on the head because uh, number six collaborations really did feel like a holdover. And just like when he hasn't released an album since 2017, I don't think he's really even been touring um, that much. I mean, I don't really follow Ed Sheeran's tour schedule, but the last few years he hasn't definitely. So he, he's just been, I, I think, uh, less in the music limelight but yeah it's 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 undeniable his success and uh, i was not aware he's the number two artist on spotify which is just mm. nuts um 
and yeah, he makes really accessible, like you said, inoffensive and catchy pop songs. And that's the recipe for, uh, and, you know, I guess the other thing is that he is not edgy in any way. No. I mean, like, like that picture you have behind you is the most edgy thing he's probably done in a very long time. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Bad Habits loud. music video. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just funny to, to think like there's a lot of moms, a lot of, a lot of young uh, kids, a lot of uh, people who just want to listen to inoffensive, catchy songs yeah. and uh, just turn their brain off. And this is what he makes. And I think that continues on equal. Um, I, I think there might be there might be a couple of moments. You know, he he does he does the uh, the 80s pop sound on here a couple of times, which, you know, you have to do if you're a pop. Why artist. not? And also he's Ed Sheeran, so he can make a song like that in his sleep. You know, it's yeah, not that exactly. much of a challenge for him. Yeah, him and Charlie Puth, same same bloodline there. Oh my God, they Puth, wake please. Up and make it I need that new Puth album, though, dude. I'm excited for that whenever that finally comes. Well, one it. of my favorite TikToks recently was Benny Blanco uh, filming Charlie Puth, filming a TikTok where he's, he's like making a song and just like clowning on him. It's really funny. But, oh, yeah. What well, were you saying? I'm sorry, cut you off. No, I think with Equals, it sounds like an Ed Sheeran album. And at this point, you know what that means. He has a brand, as you were saying. He has a really wide, broad brand. He's a corny guy. He's not threatening in any way, you know. Mm -hmm. And he rolls with the corniness, you know. He knows how to handle it uh, when you know people shit on him, and he doesn't care because at the end of the day, he's la laughing all the way to the bank. Um, again, it sounds like an Ed Sheeran album, which also means creatively, it's not like anything special either. Like this is not some new path forward for ed right it's just more ed sheeran so there's some catchy songs there's some ballads and then we're done you know it's just it's just what you expect from him um there's some songs i like but you know i think overall i, I was kind of down on the ballads on this one obviously he's had some successful ballads in his day like the a-team uh like um, I guess lo lo love yourself for Justin Bieber kind of ballady, you know, like he he's made his name on a slower song too, but I, I didn't really think too many of those jumped out at me this time. Like, uh, like was it a uh, first times where he talks about like performing for 80,000 people at Wembley. I was like, ah, okay. You know, miss me with the ballads. I, I just kind of want the catchy shit, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think the ballads worked all that great. Um, like the Joker and the queen, I don't know. Didn't really work for me. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the songs that did work for us, I guess, like jumping to that. Um, I did like the 80s uh, pop song Overpass Graffiti. Uh, yeah, that one's good. Got a little like aha type drums going on there. Appreciated that. Um, I thought Two Step was okay. Yeah, um, that's my favorite song, Two Step. You know, when he gets that like cadence was like da, 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 da. Yeah. It, it just works for him like it just like i get why people like it um i don't know uh i guess nothing else really stood, stood out too much i thought the second half like the last run nothing really caught me too yeah. much more like oh it, of the album. it after two step i think it's a it's a death march i'm like really <laughs> really bored at the end you know uh yeah. but I, I think two steps really catchy and as you said that flow like that that like more faster up tempo cadence he does you know kind of hip-hop inspired uh, I think mm -hmm. he handles that one well. Uh, I also, I like the second single, Shivers. I actually think that is a little better than Bad Habits. Kind of similar to his past, you know, formula for his big hit songs. But, uh, you know, I think it's still still catchy, still fun. Even if it's like, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing fancy. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's kind of it. Like, I don't know. I, I, like, I, <laughs> I think the, the, the music is what the music is with him at this point. I know uh, when I, before we were recording the podcast, they just seeing the three artists we were talking about. I was like, I don't know if there's any like anything new with these artists. It's just kind of the same right. old. I think War on Drugs might have added the most to their repertoire with their album. And even them, it was like uh, fringe type stuff. But, um, you know, just looking at his albums here, he started off with Plus, moved on to X slash Multiply. Then we had Divide, we're on to Equal Signs. We got to get a minus in there, right? I guess it's got to be the next one. Yeah, that's the last one. You're right. Got to got to do it. I wonder why I didn't do that before. Plus, equal. Multiply, divide, equals. That's right. Yes. Kind of cut corners doing equals already. You think minus would have came first. I know. 
maybe you maybe that. that's supposed to be. I don't know. When you think of minus, think of subtracting things. Maybe mm. he needs to go through a breakup first or something. Tough scene. Yeah. Well, uh, Ed Sheeran. I, I guess we'll we'll probably add a uh, two step onto the nostalgia best twenty twenty one on Spotify. Give that a follow and share it with all of your friends. What we do in the shadows wrapped up its third season in a fairly dramatic way. I would say um, the last two episodes kind of had me on the edge of my seat, seeing where things were going to end up. And, uh, um, you know, w- when we reviewed the first episode, our take was, this is the funniest show on television, bar none. Um, you know, and I, I think that's not counting things. Like I think you should leave, which is a sketch comedy kind of niche comedy thing. Rapid fan base though. Does that take that? This is the funniest show on TV stand for you after this season, Dave. Of course, of course. <laughs> that, that, that's probably the, the point we could, don't have to uh, hammer home too long is the show is really, really funny. And it remains so. And uh, this show needs to be nominated for Emmys uh, next year. Needs We've ignored Emmys. the first two seasons. Yeah, well, it should be winning, of course, but it needs to start getting recognized. I think that's uh, getting a little uh, blasphemous at this point. But yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many funny moments constantly. And as you said, the show, I think, took a lot of dramatic steps forward at the end of its season and showed a lot of growth, uh, I think, quite impressively at the end from a narrative perspective. But the comedy is still top notch. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I agree as well. Um, you know, it's really starting to approach like um, Parks and Rec type territory for me and i think mm-hmm. uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second where the shows uh, we we think it might be going after this season but um i i think as this show goes on as it just kind of builds out this world i, I could see it really getting up into that that stratosphere which is pretty pretty exciting to be watching from such an early time um you know well, why don't we go through some of the episodes that we liked the most this season any of that jump out mm-hmm. to you right away yeah, uh, I think early on the casino episodes really really oh, funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> also, just a great another great premise, great idea to have vampires in the modern day experience human culture that they don't understand. Of course, having them go to a casino would uh, be fireworks. It was so fucking funny. Uh, I love yeah. the um, the episode about the sire. You know, like the big like ghoul with the with the wings and how they uh. <laughs> They have to bring the Baron back, dig him out of the uh-huh. yard who they <laughs> yeah. killed in the past season. I thought the Baron's like whole return was so funny. And, like, and then he's just like, chilling. Yeah, so I know. Good. I, it's <laughs> and then I, I think some of my, my best the best quotes of the year I think are from uh, Matt Barry, <laughs> Laszlo. It's like mm-hmm. the sire. No, that's a fucking myth. Like ghosts and large penises. Like <laughs> the, once in a while they'll just drop a one liner that just as you dying you know uh i love with the baron when they're you know at, trying to catch the siren like the walmart or whatever the baron's in like a little kid's electric car he's like i'm controlling this with my mind and then the guide <laughs> holds up the remote control at them and just like shakes our head so, good. so much like like really simple humor but it just it, it always makes me laugh i think i noticed a lot of um i want to say toilet humor but a lot of like a lot of like jokes about like farting and like the bathroom. I guess yeah, I guess it is toilet humor, yeah. Um, yeah. A, lot, a, lot, a ton of dick jokes, you know. Like Laszlo was so sexual this season, and he always mm-hmm. like you know he wants to us. Uh, uh, was it suck blood and fuck forever? Whatever the quote was from the beginning yep. of the season, but it seems like you, they truly double down on that being Laz. You know, it was interesting though because Laszlo, uh, such a uh, sarcastic character, and just really like drops those like very straight delivery one-liners uh got to kind of play both sides the season and show a lot of heart towards uh, uh mm-hmm. nandor and towards colin robinson near the end of the season which i thought was uh i thought that was a good choice because um you know while the show is really funny i think for it to have a long run you really have to have these characters like caring about each other in some way and they obviously do but you don't get a lot of those like moments of them actually like expressing that Right. And that was kind think, of the whole point that they didn't ever say they cared about anything. 
Right. And, uh, you know, Nandor kind of mentions that in the uh, second to last episode when he's like, have me be the last one out of the house? Fuck that. <laughs> he's like, I got to get out of this house before they decide to leave because these houses never last, apparently. Um, <laughs> but it, I I thought that was really nice, a nice choice to kind of bring some heart into the show. Um, and yeah, so just I, I just want to say quick, I really loved the uh, casino episode, probably my favorite of the season. But I also really liked the wellness center one where uh, yeah, uh, Nandor gives up being uh, a vampire and he goes to this wellness center where they reject being a, a vampire and they yeah. pull out their fangs every day. I love the scene when she's like, ah, look at me, drink water. And then she like walks out into the hallway and you see her just like throwing it up like immediately. Um, I just thought that was funny. And then obviously you get a great Guillermo moment when he goes to like save him and fights his way through. Also some great filming, like panning over to like the big uh, uh, mirror and seeing him just like fighting nobody in the mirror was just like, I thought a really nice choice. And you see like the wall break. I was like, oh, this is like high level stuff yeah. right here. It's pretty good. Especially for TV. Um, yeah, for real. So the last two episodes, Nandor is depressed. He's had a tough season, a couple of heartbreaks, mm. uh, you know, obviously with Gale becoming a werewolf vampire who doesn't really want to be with him. It's a tough break. Um, and he's like ready to like move on. And then we get the death of Colin Robinson. Spoiler, if you haven't watched this, I, I hope that you watch this show before you get to this. You get the death of Colin Robinson at the yeah. end of episode nine. You're just kind of like, man what a what, where's the show gonna go obviously we get baby colin robinson at the very end of the season and after the gang has all gone a different direction nandor to go travel the world guillermo is in a coffin <laughs> that laszlo uh put him in uh, mm. i think to go be with uh nadia over yes in, in uh, england so uh i think the show is going in a lot of different directions now which is pretty interesting what do you think of that choice yeah, well, I think like the key thing with that is that, like as you said, Laszlo is demonstrating some growth personally, realizing he can't abandon Colin and he has to stay there. And I thought it was really tactfully done how they kind of teased throughout the season about how we're trying to learn more about the origins of energy vampires, which none of them really know anything about, including Colin. And mm -hmm. then at the end, it's like, oh, they learned, or at least Laszlo learned that he will die soon. It's like, oh wow, I did not see that coming as like the big reveal. But it took yep. a lot of a lot of balls for the show to change, you know? Like it takes a lot, mm -hmm. I think, for comedies to like try and break the mold in a certain sense, even if like the core, you know, aspects of the show we assume will stay the same. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really excited for where the show's going to go with all of them actually separated. And you have to imagine for a decent amount of time, given where they all are and um I honestly was like, I, I feel like the Colin death really hits, you know, because every, you, you love Colin Robinson. He's an amazing yeah. character. <laughs> yeah, Colin Robinson has some great moments. I love in the casino episode when he's at the, uh, I think it's a uh, what is it? blackjack, blackjack table <laughs> and he's like taking so long to decide. And he's like, so what do you guys think? <laughs> Which is my right. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, in another really funny moment from the season when Nandor is in his eternal sleep uh or whatever they yes. called it and yep uh they everybody wants to come in and see if he's as well endowed as the rumors are and they're like yes. eh, eh, it's not that big and he's asked, has to like hear all this while like faking being asleep oh right. man so good i thought uh, colin had a really funny quote about uh the next door app being a orgy of racism <laughs> <laughs> oh man that's great um yeah i just to circle back i really do like the choice to split things up i think there's a lot of potential to um like pull in uh some themes and just some commentary on uh vampires you know who are from europe and vampires who are from mm. uh america and, yeah. and just all like the you know love. meta commentary around that um i i think nandor traveling is just, just like such a, a good choice because he's just so oblivious and such an idiot right. that it's gonna work really well and nadja i think on the high council will be really funny so uh, a lot of good stuff. Baby Colin Robinson, I think, will be a great choice as well. So babies are already energy suckers. So then add a baby Colin Robinson. Oh, man. Mm, wow. It'd be tough. Do it tough. that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you're not watching In the Shadows and you like comedy at all, uh, you have to watch what we do in the shadows. So <laughs> tune into it. Any last thoughts, Dave? 
I saw one other quote I really liked from the beginning of the season when uh, Laszlo and Colin were looking for like the secret door in the library or whatever. And from across the room, Laszlo is like, that book is the Bone Brigade. That never came out in hardback, which means it's a fake. <laughs> like, there's all these like references to how he is like the most like sexually advanced and experienced person ever. It's just it's a great it's a great bit to keep going. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's move on to some uh, movies here. We're gonna start first with Bergman Island, a uh, film that premiered at Cannes this past July. Uh, this this was released in France for, back in July as well, but I don't think it's come to the states until quite recently. Yeah, I had like a really like brief run. I think like New York, LA only, and then it hit VOD uh, two weeks ago from IFC Films. So not much of a release outside of Europe, and uh, here it is, as you said, premiered at Cannes, the latest film from. Mia Hansen Love, a uh, accomplished French film director who had previously won the Golden Bear at the Berlin Film Festival. So she's uh, quite well known in uh, in Europe. I, I'm not familiar with her work to this point, but uh, this kind of got my attention because of the con reception. And also it stars Tim Roth and Vicky Kripes, two people I like. So I was like, oh, OK, definitely going to check this out when it when it comes. And here it is. Yeah, I think obviously seeing Vicky Kripes and Tim Roth uh, made me perk up at first because I was like, I don't, I don't know what to expect with this movie, especially when uh, you know this seems like they're going to some sort of island for Ing- Ingmar Bergman, you know, a director from the I believe he started in the '60s, right? '60s, '70s, yes. who's era. obviously been on on the mind recently with scenes from a marriage getting remade exactly. at HBO. Yeah, and um, <laughs> you know. I don't I'm not exactly sure what to make of this movie. Um, you know, it's a little like psychological at, at points and yeah. a little like it screws with you a, a little bit. But I also just kind of found it to be a bit like meandering at times. You know, you're really like sitting with with the scenes and sitting with some of the things that are happening. Um, I, I don't know if I found it as like riveting as maybe I was hoping. And uh, I think it, I felt a little just like losing interest at times, but it, it kept pulling me back in. Um, the Tim Roth Kripes um, dynamic was pretty good. And then obviously I think when they, when Kripes is talking about her script idea, but yeah, I mean, other than that, I don't know if too much did out. What'd you think of the film though? Yeah. So I also really, I didn't like know what the movie was about besides like what the title suggests. So I didn't know what to expect either. And what you get is a movie that's incredibly meta on many levels. And, you know, me, I'm not well-versed in Igmar Bergman's work. So the fact that this is a story where you go to the Island of Pharaoh, where Bergman uh, lived and operated as a creator, and you have all these characters having conversations about Bergman, you know, like all these cinephiles, right? It's like, okay, this is kind of all a little like over my head because I just don't really uh, know, know the material the way they do, right? Mm-hmm. On top of that, something that I only learn by reading about the film, but there's also so much meta commentary, meta storytelling from Mia Hansen Love, uh, who I, I didn't like know any of this about her, whereas Vicky Kripes and, and then also, of course, especially uh, Mia Wazikowska, but especially Vicky Kripes is like a stand in for Mia Hansen Love and Tim Roth is a stand in for her ex partner the direct famous director Olivia Sayas of which they share a child so that I was not really privy to the, her Mia Hansen loves past relationship to to see it being uh, obviously referenced and nodded to in her own film apparently she also has referenced her own life in her past work too so a lot of that stuff just kind of like as new to Bergman new to Mia Hansen love kind of like isn't like not noticed by me watching the film but I agree what you said about like the whimsical nature of the storytelling is not the most riveting thing ever, but I guess I still appreciate the movie because I really liked once we got to that like story within the story aspect mm-hmm. to the film where Kripes is explaining her screenplay or dictating it out to Tim Roth. And then we get Mia Wazkowska coming into the film and then Anders, uh, Danielson Lee as well. And I, I think I liked that part a little bit more 
but I, you probably need to know all this meta stuff to truly get everything being referenced. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, I, I had read that this was based on some of um, love's experience, but I, I didn't get a chance to like deep dive onto that too much. And, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because I think, I don't think the movie is like necessarily like poorly made or anything. I think some of the shots are really beautiful, especially some of the stuff like on the beach or like exploring the countryside of the Island. I thought it was just really, really nice. Um, and I, I think you really can feel the like distance between Cripes and Roth's character. Um, and obviously I think some of the, like the subtext of her looking for her partner to be there for her in certain ways. And he just kind of, always is looking for work or what's next and never really like supporting her it really comes across well and, and makes you kind of understand why maybe the relationship doesn't work um but again <laughs> not knowing that uh, subtext i just kind of found it to kind of be like oh okay well it seems like this woman is looking for her husband to be there he's really like self-involved and not super supportive and then she seems to like find her own ideas and doesn't really need him and goes on to have her own success that was just kind of the takeaway (laughs) i don't know i just (laughs) didn't get as much from the movie as i was hoping but still not bad not poorly made i think definitely interesting to see that greta gerwig and john tutoro were originally cast to be in the main roles would have been a very interesting movie with those two. yeah i'll say that's cool yeah shout out vicky cripes coming back to acting in a really big way post phantom thread with this and old as well as the netflix film beckett you know she she had been kind of not around since yeah she showed up kind of out of nowhere on phantom thread so that's nice to see dave something that i think has gotten a few more eyes on it than uh bergman island is army of thieves follow up from Zack snyder to his film from earlier in the year army of the dead um also interesting, I ended up watching Shaun of the Dead this past weekend. Just a lot of like zombies on the mind. You know, it's Halloween weekend. Um, but yeah, Army of Thieves. You know, so Army of the Dead, I think we we liked, right? It, we wouldn't say it's like one of the best movies of the year, but a really fun like uh, team up movie. Uh, you know, action comedy. Uh, well, well made. Um, as far as zombie action goes, pretty solid and nice to see Snyder just be freed of DC and just live in his uh, excess and, you know, lower stakes environment at Netflix. So it's happy to see that from Zach. Yeah. And uh, this prequel movie uh, following around uh, Matthias Schweinhoffer's and it is also directed Schweinhofer. By also directed by him um, following around his character, uh, Sebastian. Mm-hmm. Um, was I think a good choice? Uh, I think I think this movie is interesting and has some really like enjoyable moments. It's it's kind of um, it's, I have almost like the same exact feeling I had about Army of the Dead, which is like, yeah, this is fun. It's a lot. It's a little goofy at points. Doesn't all work, but it's still just like fun. And that's kind of what I I walked away with. How, how did you feel about it though? Totally, yeah. And I think because this movie is not a zombie action film, but rather just a very traditional heist film. It has all those easy to watch, easy to enjoy things you associate with most heist films. So uh, I think it works pretty well. It doesn't do anything you haven't seen before in a heist film. It's very referential to lots of other things like Italian Job, the Oceans movies, etc. This doesn't break any new ground, but it's still really, uh, really likable and fun, you know. And I think uh, Matthias, his performance is still really likable. You know, he's a little more um, naive and uh, awkward in his mannerisms with this character before the events of uh, Army of the Dead. You know, he's a little, I think he's a little colder as the uh, safe cracker when we first meet him, of course, in that movie. But I still liked him in this. And I think, uh, you know, he, well, obviously he's kind of the driving force of the whole movie, right? He made the story with Zach and, as you said, directed it as well. But there's some really fun moments with him. I think um, early on when he like does the safe cracking competition kind of out of nowhere mm-hmm. to him, that was fun. I like the bicycle chase he did in Prague. It's probably the best set piece for like, an action yeah. standpoint. Um, and 
yeah yeah so I, I liked it i think there's one like one key moment I, w- I would take out of the film but overall as far as heist movies go it, it's fun you know i feel like a lot of people like heist movies you know it's kind of hard to dislike them <laughs> yeah no for sure it's a fun heist movie i i think the the action scene i liked the most actually was the final like uh safe cracking where they're in the car while right. he's cracking i thought that was pretty good um and the scenes you mentioned as well um i really liked seeing uh natalie emmanuel yes back um mm-hmm. miss ande from game of thrones um yeah. she's absolutely stunning and i think plays her role as gwendolyn pretty well um ruby ophie i, I thought was just really fun in this movie as uh karina the um, tech person and just like super charismatic her and matthias are dating in real life so uh you know shouts to him it's kind of funny that she asked to like make out with him in the movie and he's like eh, no thanks <laughs> um funny. but yeah well, so tell me what was the choice that you wish they'd taken out i i'd say it's like the rom commie romance element between mm. uh sebastian and Gwendoline, just because it kind of felt like a little forced in there I don't know if I totally bought them like coming together romantically there at the end. No, it, it, it didn't uh, take away from the movie for me, but I just thought it was probably the weakest aspect of the film. Um, but yeah, I, I also like the manual a lot. It's kind of her character Ramsey from fast and furious, but just with more things to do um, in this film. So I think she, she does this well and I like to see her in more roles because again, she doesn't have a lot of like huge acting roles. She's been a, most notably a side player to this point, as you said. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I actually really liked um, Stuart Martin as Brad Cage, just because and then they talk about in the film how, like, <laughs> Brad Cage, this, like, macho man of these American action heroes, you know, it's like, I actually no like No one's how, actually like, named Brad Cage. <laughs> yes, I like how on the nose that is in terms of, like, a trope in these types of movies and just movies in general, you know? Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I think obviously the uh, the romance aspect almost worked more so to get him to like flip on Matthias and create some drama right. there that actually like work for the film. I, I, I did not super like the ending where uh, Delacroix just kind of like lets him go. But I mean, whatever, like it's it's really fine. And for a, a, a movie that I had zero real expectations going into, I thought this was pretty fun. So you, you can right. find a worse way to spend an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. I guess one thing that I think you just kind of have to go with and just accept is that like so many of these characters are just super infallible at what they do, right? You have yeah. amazing, perfect safe cracker, amazing hacker, amazing pickpocket, amazing gunman, you know? Uh, yeah. And then on the other hand, like you mentioned uh, Delacroix, like I feel like those cop characters they really only exist in the movie to be the cops chasing them. Like there's nothing else to those characters, which again, it's all fine. The movie comes together perfectly well and, and it's still fun. Um, I also, I like the, uh, like the lock and safe like visuals as he's cracking it when we're seeing the mechanisms in the vault moving and turning and all that. That was pretty cool. On the other hand, him cracking the, the safes, it's always just Mateus, uh, putting his ear to the vault and listening. That's that's really all it was at the end of the day. Huh? We just got to watch him that's turn the thing. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. It makes it look listen. so easy. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's fun. It's it's a fun movie. Uh, check it out on Netflix if you have some time. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments below. Oh, but Dave, we finally got here. The movie I've been excited to talk about since I saw it this past weekend Last night in Soho, uh, Edgar Wright's most recent film, uh, a psychological horror film, which you know you wouldn't necessarily expect from him. Um, so a bit of a different direction. Um, we really haven't seen him directing too much stuff since Baby Driver in 2017. And I, I don't know if he's done any TV, but no movies, obviously. Yeah, he had um, the Sparks Brothers documentary also come out this year, but this is his first. Uh... Uh, feature film since baby driver and you know i think when when we think about edgar wright you know i mentioned i watched on the dead earlier hot fuzz scott pilgrim well known and and very like specifically known right has a very specific style um a lot of like needle drops very specific 
needle drops, I would say. Um, you know, he his films kind of carry this like light hearted edge to like some very he's genre blending, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But usually yes. like infuses comedy with uh with a car with a car movie, a driving movie, uh with a zombie movie, with a police movie. You know, that's just kind of his thing. He has a unique wit as well that he brings into his film. He's uh definitely a unique voice. And I mean he's also really popular on Twitter. You know, he's 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 very well liked and has been for some time. So last night in Soho comes out. I was very excited for it. Did were you excited going in? What was your like tenor? So I guess I wasn't super excited. You know, I was like, oh, Edgar Wright movie, gotta see it. With Anya Taylor Joy, Thompson McKenzie. I was already gonna see it, but nice, you know, very happy yeah. about that. Um, I guess the fact that there's a psychological horror element to it made it like not like my most anticipated movie ever, just because mm-hmm. that's not my bag. I was like, all right, I'll just I'll suck it up and watch it and and deal with it it's not really that scary there's some jump scares but like it's not as scary as even stuff like us or get out which aren't like even the scariest things ever right so i think it, it's right. it's pretty palatable for people that don't like too much horror and it's really only like the back half of the movie where it even shows up right um mm-hmm. but yeah so i mean I, i'm also not like a diehard edgar wright guy the way some people are like i i think it's for me it's the scott pilgrim i don't have as much uh, affinity for it the way a lot of people do most people say it's his mm. best film but like i like it but i don't like love the movie or anything but i did really like baby driver which happened to be his biggest hit so him getting the clout to make whatever he wanted next post baby driver being a huge hit uh definitely was exciting to me and the fact that he wanted to do a period piece of sorts 1960s london um was appealing so i uh, still was looking forward to it obviously this was delayed several times out of April 2020 when it was originally supposed to come out. Anya Taylor Joy had filmed this before she filmed Queen's Gambit. That's the timeline there. Mm-hmm. Did did this movie what were you uh did you like the movie? I guess let's just start there. Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. I, I think uh the beginning's a lot better than the end though. I think um hmm. it gets a little muddy, a little messy, and I think it's I guess tough to grasp the message at the end. So I wouldn't hold this up to his best films, but I still think there's, a, there's plenty of things to like about it, even if it's, yeah. you know, it might not hold, uh, match his high standard. Yeah. You know, I, I, th- I really like this movie. Um, I'm a bit more of a horror fan than, than you are. Um, I, and I thought it was like fairly scary. I think, I think it's right on par for me with like us, maybe us and, get out a little more tense i i I see us as more of a horror film than than get out it is but um you know just the overall like style of the movie i i thought the twists in it worked really well um definitely was surprised by like the the ending twist of uh what was actually going on with the room and, and where like the spirits or energy was coming from um you know i i think there was a propulsion to the film. Like there were, there were some points when things might have slowed down or cooled down a bit, but overall I felt like it was paced really well. Love obviously all the music drops. I think there's one scene in particular that just stands out to me as like probably my favorite, one of my favorite scenes from the year for sure. So I I was, I overall left really pleased. I, I do think there's some like some choices that happen at the end that just like don't make any sense. And we'll, we'll, we'll probably get to that. Um, but overall I was, I was, I really liked it. Um, why don't, I mean, just to kind of like give the people listening who obviously hopefully saw the movie, just a quick synopsis. Uh, Thomas and McKenzie plays Ellie, uh, uh, art, art and design student, fashion design student goes to London, uh, has a hard time making friends in her dorm, rents a room. This room immediately starts to pull her or she starts having dreams in this room, can interact in the dreams with Anya Taylor Joy who she's like embodying in the dreams and then things start in the sixties. Yeah. Things start to turn not so good. Uh, I guess we'll just kind of like leave it at that and we'll spoil more Mm -hmm. near the end. Tell me what you liked about the first half of the movie that worked for you so well. Yeah. As you said, I think that momentum is good. I think all the setup is good with Ellie. And once we get that first like turn where she goes back to the sixties and meets Sandy he doesn't meet her, but you know, encounters Sandy and sees what happens. And then you get this amazing, 
you know, set piece, which I think is right up there with a lot of his best set pieces, like the baby driver opening race or opening drive part and the Scott Pilgrim fighting at the end. You get this kind of mirror walk and talk like dance between Anya Teller, Joy, Sandy and Matt Smith's character. Meanwhile, Thomas and McKenney in through the mirror is visible and still kind of mimicking that and dancing with Matt Smith. And it goes back and forth with your perspective. Obviously, very impressive how they managed to film that with the choreography and, and, and everything. But I thought that scene was really great and really hooks you. And as you said, I think the momentum really picks up at that point and you're really invested in this. And you can, and obviously Ellie's character uh, can't think about much else besides going to sleep at night to experience more of Sandy's you know, burgeoning desire to break out into the uh, club scene in London as a, uh, as a singer. And I think that's definitely where the movie shine the best is like that part right there. And I still like it a little bit after that, but I feel like eventually once things start to go bad for Sandy and plus also go bad for Ellie, we get a bit of wheel spinning, but also just a bit of less interesting plot happening, right? Like the setup is so great and so fun. It was a little grating to me watching Ellie kind of lose her mind in front of everyone like the third time it happened, you know, because nothing actually changed all that much with that. She wasn't learning too much more information. On the other hand, I love the red herring with the old man played by Terrence mm-hmm. Stamp. Thought that was done really well. Um, I liked everything with Diana Rigg, her final performance. So I think, I think it's just a little messier than people might expect from Edgar Wright's best. But yeah, and I, and I guess like, once we start seeing her actually being haunted by the ghosts, once you know who the ghosts are, I don't know if it like dramatically totally like landed for me. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of like, I feel like where the, the key problem could be with the ending in terms of whether you're invested in those ghosts or not. But yeah, overall, I think, I think the, the beginning is really great. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the first half of the movie is like un undeniable i think like you mentioned the setup you really hate jacasta so much um (laughs) what's her name uh sinov carlson plays her so well (laughs) um just hated her uh and you know you i think you're really like bought into that that feeling of like being a fish out of water type situation just trying to like find her place and you start to really enjoy ellie finding that confidence as she's embodying sandy and um you know trying to like mimic her in real life um I, I think matt smith is just great in this and you know he's he plays that like slimy uh like cunning character just so perfectly it's a little off-putting almost he, he's definitely a star on the rise and has been for a while obviously in the crown and uh, doctor who so he's he's had his, his trajectory is just up, up. well now he's gonna play damon blackfire in House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones spinoff. Yeah. Can't wait for him in that. Yeah, I thought yeah, he was yeah. great in this. Yeah, so he, yeah, I thought he was fantastic. Um, I, I agree. I think a little bit of the, like, her losing her mind, being haunted by these ghosts in real life, um, does start to feel a little samey and, and maybe could have been shortened a bit. Um, although I do think the scene where they go to the school dance uh, was really mm. awesome when they sure. have... Um, Susie and the Banshees um, happy house playing in the background was just like an amazing scene and has stuck with me. I've been playing that song all weekend. Also yes. playing um, house of balloons. Uh, yeah. So I was like the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Um, just uh, been on repeat for me. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think the ending for me um, when Diana rig shares with her that, uh, you know, she was the real killer. I, I that actually surprised me. Not going to lie. I did not see that coming. And I, I think that twist worked. I don't know if I cared so much about the guys that she killed because obviously they're framed in the movie as just pieces of shit, you know, who just take right. advantage of these women. Yeah, and that was kind of my thing too. It's like, are you trying to set up Sandy as like the actual villain? Because she was a someone kind of forced into prostitution and not happy with how her life went and a tragic character. Mm-hmm. And now you have to, like like, were you trying to make me not like her? Because if so, well, then I have to feel bad for all those ghosts that are asking Ellie for help to be freed and, and, and for revenge and stuff. But again, as you said, 
those are just the ghosts of dead Johns and, and abusive yeah. men and everything. So it's like <laughs> that, that kind of all got twisted for me. I wasn't really know, knew, knew exactly where I was supposed to sit uh, with that. Uh, it's, it's no big deal. There's a lot, there's a lot of like talk about like, like the, you know, the, the politics of, of like that message and, and everything. And right. It's fine. Um, honestly, like, I think Thomas and McKenzie is really good in the beginning. This is like her first like big, like lead role since she broke mm-hmm. out a few years ago, at leave no trace. Um, she'll be in power of the dog in a smaller role coming up later this year as well. Uh, everyone knows she's a really talented young actress. So looking forward to seeing more from her in the future. Ani Taylor Joy doesn't have a whole lot to do, you know. I think again, like that 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 first mirror dance scene with Matt Smith is probably her yeah. best moment, honestly, where you get like all the charms and magnetism we associate with her as a performer there. But like dramatically, she's still kind of a supporting piece at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, certainly more of a supporting piece. I I also thought the scene when. Um, you know, she uh, she like breaks the mirror and then uh, Matt Smith's uh, Jack comes like find her and she's like running away from him throughout the scene. And I think it's like switching between her and Thomas and Mackenzie throughout is, is uh, a scene where she gets to do a little bit more as well. Um, but yeah, she's she's just kind of a one note character for the most part. Um, you know, I, in terms of the ending, I think I wanted uh, to just touch real quick. I hadn't thought too much about whether I was supposed to sympathize with um, Mrs. Collins or not and, and Sandy uh, you know, or, or see her as a bad character. I guess I, I saw her more as a tragic character, um, mm-hmm. but I, I thought more so the ending touched on the idea of nostalgia um, and yes. just like Thomas and McKenzie's character, you know, has, has this longing for this time that is so idealized in her mind because it's a connection with her mother um, and, and her grandmother. But really, I think what it's supposed to say is just like, uh, you know you can long for these times that you didn't have but when you actually like pull open what was going on at these times it's not all you know rainbows and butterflies and everything's shining like gold there's a lot of real shit there especially somewhere like london which you know famously uh has some very dark periods and um that this movie highlights parts of that um i i agree i think they maybe the the message around sandy is a bit muddled and and mis mismanaged but you know left up for interpretation i suppose um any other moments or anything else that really stood out to you about the film overall i like the production design of it a lot you know they they did a lot of shooting in the soho neighborhood which as this movie which suggests as most people know is a very hot spot you know I, i guess like loosely it's like like the east village new york city's east village equivalent in london it's a it's a popping area and they did a lot of filming at like three in the morning and stuff to make it work. Um, and like I said, I think that that dance number in the beginning, which obviously had its own obstacles to clear to make, uh, really yeah. lands. So uh, that's all great. I think, you know, Diana Rigg gets a lot to chew in at the end. You know, she honestly gets more to chew on than Anya Teller Joy does at the end of the day, funny enough. Um, and yeah, I, I honestly like love Terrence Stamp. Like when, when, when he dies, and then you realize that he was actually that, that, that cop from the flashback. It's like, oh, fuck. That was, yeah. I thought it was done really well because they set him up as being really unlikable. And like, mm-hmm. you're not rooting for him. And you want Thomas and McKenzie to like nail him and, fr- and like yeah. and prove that it was him. And that, that's all handled great. No, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, going just to circle back to some of the problems I had with the final scene. So Miss Collins poisons... Ellie, and then eventually she just is like, "Oh, the poison isn't working on me anymore." Oh, yeah, I wonder about that too. Yeah, and also John gets like Bobby stabbed in the stabbed stomach, bad. <laughs> and then like a couple weeks later, it's just like at this fashion show, like it's all good, mm-hmm. bro. I yeah, don't know. it's uh, yeah. I yeah. like John. Yeah. He was just really like wholesome, nice presence as a character. Yeah, you know, I actually have to say if they um they didn't touch on this much in the movie, but an old woman going up to the room of a young woman who's with a black man um, in London could have been handled very differently in the movie. And True. you know some of the racial tones could have been uh, brought up there. So I was actually surprised the movie didn't touch on that at all, but I think that would have taken away more from what Edgar was going for. So, right. um, you know, we haven't done Edgar Wright rankings. Maybe we'll do that in the future for the next movie he has coming yeah, out, but definitely he, you said that this is like mid tier for you. What would you put above it for sure? What's your favorite? 
It's hard to beat Shaun the Dead. I I honestly should rewatch all of his movies. I didn't see a lot of them um, as an adult, you know. Um, and it's funny. I feel like I'm higher on Baby Driver than a lot of other people. So I like to reexamine everything. But I think Shaun the Dead and Scott Pilgrim seem to be at the top for most people. And then mm-hmm. at World's End is kind of like a sleeper hit for mm-hmm. many. Um, so I, I'd say it's definitely um, it's, pro- it's probably below most of those, but I have to compare it by rewatching first. Yeah. I haven't seen Fistful of Fingers, which is this like student film back in right. yeah, the day. Either. Um, but, but yeah, pro- Scott Pilgrim would probably be my favorite. And then, you know, Shaun of the Dead. I, you know, I haven't seen Hot Fuzz in a minute, so I'd have to probably watch to say more. It, it's probably like right, right below Baby Driver for me, you know, especially right. if we're not including Ant-Man where he was replaced. So that's right. Yeah. The Edgar Wright Ant-Man movie. What could have been? Yeah. Um, <laughs> also, we need to note that uh, Last Night in Soho was a complete box office failure, unfortunately, made only four million or so dollars at the opening uh, weekend, which is below its paltry tracking of like eight million. So just big, big failure there, which is big disappointment considering Baby Driver made over 100 million domestically, 226 worldwide. Uh, just another example of how takes a lot to get people to show up for more adult fare, even though someone like Edgar Wright has a lot of fans, well-known, and yet older people stayed home. So this is a Focus Features movie. Remember in 2020, they did a lot of like 17-day theatrical window, then right to VOD. I think it's basically a lock now that this movie will be on VOD in three weeks. So hopefully a lot more people will check it out then because it just didn't... Uh, it didn't work at the box office, unfortunately. Check it out whenever you can. Go to the movies and see it, please. Um, but Dave, what should the people be tuning into for next week? So next week, we have a movie that people will be showing up for. Marvel's Eternals is, is out. Oh, yeah. As well as Pablo Reigns, Princess Diana film, Spencer, starring... Chris and Stewart. A lot of Oscar buzz around that. That movie will be out in a wide-ish release. So excited to talk about that one as well. We also have the Netflix Western starring uh, Netflix Black Western, The Harder They Fall, coming out tomorrow with Idris and Jonathan Majors and many others. Very excited about that. And then also uh, the Snail Mail uh, sophomore album is coming out after several yeah. years. So plenty of good stuff coming and I'm sure we'll find some more things to get in there um tom hanks is miguel sapochnik movie finch will be coming out on apple tv plus as well so we'll see Maybe if we'll that's any that. good yeah uh yes uh so stay tuned youtube.com slash nostalgia pod soundcloud.com slash nostalgia pod and all the ways to listen to us nostalgia pod best of 2021 on spotify check it all out we'll see you next week